Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. For those of you that know me, know I'm going to say hostel at least 55 times in the next four minutes. Make no apology for that. Um, it is my pleasure and privilege to join you this evening for the National Security Dinner. Thanks, Aspie, for the uh, opportunity to say a few words and to introduce our, our guest speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Bill Shorten MP, who shall give us his perspective on, uh, at, the, at the end of this uh, short intro. Before we hear from Bill, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the success story that is Austal. Austal is an Australian homegrown global shipbuilder and defence prime contractor, maritime technology partner of choice. We've been designing, constructing and supporting defence and commercial vessels around the, around the world. In fact, more than 250 ships have been delivered to over 100 operators in 44 countries. So we've got some experience as an exporter and as an Australian exporter at, the, at that. Um, we're operating shipyards in, in the US, um, primarily in the US actually, but also in Australia and the Philippines. And I just want to talk a little bit about the programs we have underway. So in the US, we're the prime contractor for two major naval shipbuilding programs for the US Navy, the Littoral Combat Ship and the Joint High Speed Vessel. 127 meter Littoral Combat Ship is a sort of Anzac sized ship. It's designed by Austal, it's fast frigate like. Um, 40 knots, unrivaled sea keeping, stability, maneuverability. It really is driving a revolution in the way that the Navy conduct their job. And now uh, we've had tremendous support in the US in uh, getting that program off the ground. We're also running, uh, that's a sort of $4 billion program. In addition to that, we're, we're building 10 um, joint high-speed vessels, which are a sort of maritime transport ship, $1.6 billion. So we're running these programs concurrently in the US. It's about five, five or $6 billion of work. We're actually delivering four ships a year out of a shipyard with 5,000 people in. Um, here in Australia, we're... Uh, actually, there's a couple of things I want to say about the US. Firstly, when we're done with those US Navy programs, we'll have delivered 15% of the US Navy fleet. I think that's a pretty remarkable fact. And then secondly, we're the only non-US prime to ever de deliver a warship to the US Navy. So for an Australian homegrown talent, I think that's a, a pretty exceptional... Uh, a fact too. Here in Australia, we're delivering the eighth of the Cape class fleet, which is a $330 million program we've built for Border Force. Um, they've all been on schedule, and we've actually been delivering um, a ship every 10 weeks to Border Force over the last 18 months, which is uh, pretty fast throughput. Cape class patrol boat is bigger and faster than its predecessor. It's impressed both owners and operators alike. And the CEO of Australian Border Force recently said in, uh, in, in um, Senate hearings, it was an exceptional build, fulfilling the entire range of ABF's maritime responsibilities under Border Protection Command. This is pretty positive feedback from the customer. What I would say is that we've achieved that high level of productivity and quality that's been acknowledged, whilst at the same time building two 72-metre high-speed transport vessels for the Royal Navy of Oman. These vessels are also on schedule for delivery in 2016. Ships are comparable to the ones that we're building for the US Navy and are now being built at a lower cost base in Australia than they are in the United States in our same facility where the exchange rate is down below 80 cents. These export programs, including the high-speed support vessels for the Royal Navy of Oman, have been a critical element of our global success and continue to underpin our strategy for sustainable growth in naval shipbuilding. That's just about the end of the, uh, the advert. So before I hand over to, to Bill, I'd like to tell you two things about Bill that maybe not too many people know. I didn't get this from David Feeney, Bill, I promise. Yeah. So the, fir the first fact is that Bill served in the Australian Army Reserve with the Monash University Regiment, and he has made it a strong feature of his leadership to emphasize the need for bipartisanship on national security issues. I think that's something that doesn't often come out. And secondly, maybe more importantly, the first time I met Bill, he said to me, you know, we love shipbuilders. My grandfather was one once upon a time. Let's face it, shipbuilding in Australia could do with some love. Please join me in welcoming Bill Shorten. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for making some time to uh, give me the opportunity to address such a distinguished group of policy thinkers. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Austel, so that's one mention. Um, in all seriousness, uh, Austel are doing a very good job, and they're representing Australia on the world stage, although uh, I think the American Navy has periodically used foreign-built ships before, but I had to check it out, and it was um, captured Spanish gunboats in the American Spanish War of 1898. Um, but I think since then, it would be true to say that uh, Austel's the first foreign shipyard or foreign uh, company to be building ships for America, so that's a really remarkable achievement. I'm here tonight with a range of my colleagues because we all take uh, the issues which APSI turns its mind to very seriously. I've got my shadow cabinet minister colleague, uh, Senator Stephen Conroy. I've got my shadow ministerial colleague, David Feeney, and shadow parliamentary secretary, Gay Brotman, all here because they take the issues in terms of our strategic future and defence very seriously. I'm also accompanied by my advisor, Mike Kelly, who I hope um, will return to the parliament as the next member for Eden Monero. Tonight I intend to outline Labor's strategic priorities and I want to address three main topics. One, the three pillars of Labor's security policy and the capability we will need to fulfil our responsibilities. Two, Australia's ongoing role in combating Daesh in Iraq and also extremism here at home. And three, the growing threat to global security posed by climate change. Uh, I appreciate Andrew's words. Uh, under my leadership, Labor has consistently sought to build bipartisanship on national security. Indeed, the Prime Minister has been generous enough to acknowledge that on a number of occasions. And the reason why I believe in bipartisanship and national security is because Labor believes in keeping, that keeping Australians safe transcends politics. We understand that the security of our nation runs deeper than partisan differences. We also know that no individual, no party, has a monopoly on patriotism, love of our country or care for our citizens. We all enjoy the rights and liberties of our safe, remarkable, peaceful democracy equally. And we all have an equal responsibility to uphold them, to defend them and to preserve the security of our nation. So on that basis, let me talk to you about Labor's three pillars and our capabilities. Labor believes in an international role for Australia built upon three pillars. One, a strong alliance with the United States. Two, closer engagement with the United Nations and multilateral institutions. And three, a comprehensive relationship with the Indo-Pacific region. Turning to the US alliance, I said to the Australian-American leadership dialogue on the weekend that I firmly believe that American energy, American ideas, and American leadership will be as important and decisive in this century as they were in the last. Australia's alliance with the United States is at the heart of our defence and security arrangements. We recognise, as we long have, that this relationship is beneficial to both Australia and also the Indo-Pacific region. It, is, it was, of course, Labor's uh, great wartime Prime Minister, John Curtin, who first looked to America when Australia faced its darkest hour. Curtin articulated a clear vision for Australia's place in the world and our relationship with the United States. And now, for more than six decades, ours has been a relationship of unparalleled diplomatic, economic, trade, defence and cultural exchange. Successive governments have built upon Curtin's foundations. It was Whitlam and Hawke that established Australian sovereignty as a fundamental principle of our cooperation with the United States on Australian soil. 
they created a framework for cooperation that has seen the ties between our two nations and our militaries grow stronger. And it was under Prime Minister Gillard that Australia and the United States agreed to the force posture initiatives in the North. Initiatives underpinning a new era of peacetime cooperation between our militaries and a platform for increased cooperation with partners throughout our region. I and the Labor Party that I'm privileged to lead believe that US engagement in our region is a force for good. It's helped underwrite decades of security and prosperity. This is why Labor will always support a US presence in the Indo-Pacific. Now, of course, though, we live in an emerging region. The economic and social transformation occurring in our region is unprecedented in its size, its scope, its pace. China, of course, is at the centre of these changes. But it is not exclusively the whole story. The impressive rise of India under Prime Minister Modi should be better appreciated. As should growth in the ASEAN economies, as should the enduring economic strength of Japan and South Korea. And any Australian government must be attuned to the great potential of Indonesia as it continues its transformation from a nation of regional significance to one of global influence. But it is the China story that is best known. Labor strongly supports the peaceful rise of China. In less than a generation, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. It is a transformation unparalleled in human history. Put simply, China's success is Australia's success. I believe that Australia should, can, and must have a close, constructive relationship with China. I do not subscribe to the idea of an inescapable binary choice between our alliance with the United States and our growing relationship with China. As I said to President Xi in our parliament in November, diplomacy is not a zero-sum game. I do, not believe that, I do not believe that strategic confrontation is inevitable, as some prophecy. In fact, the economic interdependence between China and the United States is of such an order of magnitude that the two countries' growing diplomatic, cultural and military links are so entwined that the escalation of tensions is contrary to the interests of both powers and the rest of the region. I said, though, that we're interested not just in the region and the United States alliance, but multilateral institutions in the United Nations. As a good international citizen, Australia will always have a constructive part to play in the deliberation and actions of the United Nations. I remember that there was a great deal of criticism levelled at the former Labor government for its pursuit of one of the non-permanent seats on the United Nations Security Council. And either the chief critics from that time have undergone a very swift change of heart, or perhaps they knew all along just how hollow their arguments were. I believe that Australia's two years at the table of the Security Council were a powerful and timely reminder of the value our nation can add to the international stage, and a reminder and illustration of the importance of multilateral diplomacy. Multilateral diplomacy works in our region too, indeed equally true. Our region, after all, is where we most commonly face the challenges of instability and political divisions or communal violence which will require our assistance. In the past, Australia has not always adequately identified or addressed developing situations leading to delayed action at greater cost. And at times our interventions have restored public security without identifying or re rectifying the underlying causes, such as fault lines in regional government, governance or security sectors. Enhancing the capability of the Australian Civil Military Centre, Labor established in government, is one way I submit that we can improve this. Diffusing tensions in our regions, combating the revival of an anti-Western strain of terrorism in Southeast Asia, 
also depends upon our continued leadership in multilateral institutions. We have a proud history as a key architect of APEC and a founding member of both the East Asia Summit and the first ASEAN Dialogue Partner. ASEAN has made a remarkable contribution to establishing stable relations amongst the nations of Southeast Asia. And it's through ASEAN that we must continue to encourage the pursuit and the completion of the code of conduct process to help shape behaviour around maritime disputes. Australia is not a disinterested observer in this matter. As a trading nation, we have direct interest in freedom of navigation and an international system of laws and accepted behaviours. Like all nations, we have right of passage through the oceans and skies of the region in accordance with international law. Around one third of the world's shipping transits through the South China Sea. Around American dollars, $5.3 trillion in total trade passes through the area each year. It is in no nation's interest for the current heightened tensions to continue. It's important that all the claimant states seek to de-escalate tensions and work within the ASEAN framework to finalise a code of conduct as soon as possible. And Labor urges all of the parties to abide by both the terms and the spirit of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. I believe it's important that we provide greater certainty for our defence forces. Labor's ambition for our nation has always been to have the most self-reliant and independent defence capability possible. We are, a, we are a nation with crucially important sea and air trading lanes and defending our air and sea gap is a high priority for the kinds of capability that we acquire. Equally important is the need to respond effectively to our obligations as a good international citizen, a dependable ally, and to protect Australians abroad. I have listened, as my team has, carefully to the advocacy of a wide range of defence and national security experts, indeed many of you in this room. More than anything, I hear the message that defence needs certainty in its funding arrangements. The certainty to invest in the people, the certainty to invest in the capability that are essential to the effective defence of our nation. Labor has previously committed to increasing funding towards a target of 2% of GDP. We urge and encourage the government to set out a credible trajectory to 2% of GDP in their forthcoming white paper. We believe that a credible trajectory, which is capable of bipartisan support, is in Australia's national interest. Under Labor, I want our defence and security agencies to be known for three particular qualities. Flexibility, agility and imagination more capable than ever before of generating a broad range of responses across the spectrum of operations. We need a defence force, networked from satellite to soldier, equipped with fully integrated and secure systems. This will include coming to grips with the management of data on a huge scale and being at the cutting edge of electronic warfare, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and command and control research and technology. And the contemporary security environment demands that our ADF is a balanced force, a force that is able to protect Australia and its people, and able to integrate and interoperate with our American ally and other key part partners in the pursuit of shared security interests. These principles have shaped Labor's approach to programs such as the Growler, and the Joint Strike Fighter, aircraft that will give Australia a capability edge and operate seamlessly with the United States. It is why we have been strong supporters of acquiring capabilities like the C-17 aircraft and the landing heli helicopter dock ships. These impressive capabilities give our defence forces 
The flexibility to manage mass civilian evacuations and disaster relief in our region, as well as sustaining force projection in conventional missions. Our continued focus on Australia, having the ability to provide for its own security, is why Labor believes in maintaining our strategically vital shipbuilding capability. We learn the hard way what happens when you offshore national security with the Oberon-class submarines that we purchased from the United Kingdom. During the Falklands War, British support for our Oberons became increasingly difficult to obtain. Going as far back as before the Second World War when we sold the Commonwealth steamship line, we simply then did not have enough Australian vessels and we simply then did not have enough seafarers and marine engineers to meet the needs of the Australian Navy in time of war. History repeats. You understand this from the work you do. So therefore we should not afford to repeat, we cannot afford to repeat the mistakes, especially when our region is going through a period of intense military modernisation. It is why we will ensure that the next generation of submarines are built, maintained and sustained in Australia. This is an investment in our national security and our national capacity. Good jobs, leading innovation and vital skills. Of course, one of the, without doubt, one of the most persistent and challenging threats we now face as a nation are cyber attacks. We need secure systems to guard against this, from our security agencies and defence industry through to our general, private, commercial and industrial establishments and utilities. When last in office, Labor invested in the establishment of a whole of government cyber security centre. And in government, we will continue to ensure that Australia is a leader in technological countermeasures and that our networks evolve and adapt to meet these new challenges. I'd like to talk briefly about Iraq. As you know, Labor has given strong support to Australia's involvement in the current international mission, humanitarian mission in Iraq. We do not offer this to the government lightly or without deep consideration. We recognise, as Labor always has, that sending Australians into harm's way is the most serious of decisions that a government can make. Our cooperation on this issue is not a matter of reflexive jingoism, or nationalism. It was the calculation of conscience taken in the national interest underpinned by four key principles. One, that we wouldn't support the deployment of ground combat units to directly engage in fighting Daesh. Two, that Australian operations should be confined to the territory of Iraq. Three, our involvement should continue only until the Iraqi government is in a position to take full responsibility for the security of their people and their nation. And four, that if the Iraqi government and its forces engage in unacceptable conduct or adopt unacceptable policies, Australia should withdraw its support. But we do recognise the situation in Iraq is dynamic and fluid. I was privileged to visit Baghdad earlier this year and to see the professionalism of our ADF representatives. We are doing good work there. Our fundamental objective, therefore, is for the Australian military personnel to carry out a clearly defined mission in Iraq to protect civilians and to build the capacity of Iraqi security forces and then to return safely home. It is not possible to negotiate with Daesh because there is nothing rational about their worldview or their objectives. They deal only in violence and they must be met with force. But as you understand of students of history and contemporary politics, ultimately success in Iraq will depend upon the people of Iraq themselves. Our capacity building mission is designed to provide Iraqi armed forces with the skills and training to repel and overcome Daesh. This will have to be matched by the efforts of the Iraqi government to develop a coherent strategy to ensure the loyalty and assistance of all of the sections of the Iraqi population in this endeavour. Without such efforts, the cycle of conflict spurred on by the radical groups exploiting sectarian and ethnic tensions will continue to undermine Iraq's long-term survival. Put simply, we know that through our efforts we cannot drain the swamp of terrorism. It's going to take the leadership and commitment of the people of Iraq. But Iraq is, of course, only one theatre in a global struggle. 
The rise of fanaticism is not a conflict between states. It is a transnational threat. It is a deadly threat in Yemen, Somalia, Nigeria, as well as Iraq and Syria. It is no exaggeration to say that the same brand of extremism that our men and women are fighting in the Middle East can threaten us here in Australia. One message must be made clear time and time again. The handful of Australians lured to the war zone in Iraq or tempted to replicate acts of terror here at home do not reflect the values of Islam, nor do they represent our nation's diverse and generous Muslim Australian community. I've heard many Muslim leaders say that Islam is a religion of peace. I know they mean it, and I thank them for that. Not for one minute would Labor seek to dismiss the threat of terrorism or minimising, minimise it. We know there is never any excuse for aiming violence at the innocent. And for those who seek to cross the very clear boundary of right and wrong, they should always feel the full force of the law. But our goal has to be to work with the Muslim Australian community through cooperation, not isolation. I keep in mind the advice of the former Director General of ASIO, David Irvine, when he said, the strongest defence against violent extremism in this, against violent extremism is the Australian Muslim community itself. This must inform a more balanced approach to counter-terrorism and community engagement. The final topic I want to deal with tonight is climate change. Now, I understand that climate change is not always spoken of in the national security context, but it should be. And I know that ASPE's taken up this cause too in recent times. Anthony Bergen and Michael Thomas recently wrote that America's actions were a signal Australia needed to do more. For me, some of the most powerful arguments for action on climate change came from two reports produced by an elite group of 33 retired three- and four-star officers from the United States Army, Navy, Air Force and Marine Corps. These leaders who have dealt with the Soviet nuclear threat dealt with political extremism and transnational terrorism, have stated unequivocally the national security risks of projected climate change are as serious as any challenge we have faced. Let me repeat that, because this is not an argument you hear in Australian media as often as we should. The national security risks of projected climate change are as serious as any challenge we have faced. That is not a statement by the Greens, by an environmental lobby group. It's from 33 former three and four star generals of the American military. Put it another way, we know that more extreme weather means greater demand for our military personnel to assist in disaster recovery at home and in the region. And even more significantly, it will exacerbate conditions for political instability, poverty, food shortages, displaced persons. As the experts wrote in 2014, the impacts of climate change will be more than threat multipliers. They will serve as the catalysts of instability and conflict. More than just threat multipliers, they are the catalyst for instability and conflict. This is where climate change and energy security intersect. If Australia does not deal with our dependence on offshore oil supplies and adapt our energy mix to secure renewable alternatives, we will be increasingly hostage to global instability. I used to be a former union organiser of oil production facilities in Australia, and one by one they are closing. And we can always assume that oil we source from Singapore will always get here easily. But again, we shouldn't assume that. Renewable energy and developing alternative sources of energy are as important to our future national security as they are to dealing with climate change. Think about the combination of ongoing uncertainty in the Middle East, the fact that our oil is a dwindling resource, volatile in price, and as I've said, increasingly refined overseas. 
the security case for renewable energy becomes even more compelling. I believe this year's Climate Change Summit in Paris is an opportunity for a new global declaration of intent. Australia must be a credible, constructive, engaged voice in this discussion and a meaningful contributor to the solution. We all understand here that national security is always, always better served by bipartisanship. But bipartisanship has never meant unthinking, mute acquiescence. It requires an opposition constructively engaging with the issues, identifying areas for improvement, offering solutions, and ensuring that serious decisions are treated with the careful consideration and scrutiny that they deserve. And when there are gaps in the national conversation, when long-term challenges are being overlooked, Labor will not hesitate. Will not hesitate to put forward our plans, our views and our priorities for Australia's current and future national security. This is what the Australian people expect of us as an alternative government. This is the responsibility we will fulfill because as I've said, no one in this country has a monopoly on patriotism or love of this country. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, now we get into the uh, karaoke event of the <laughs> evening. Uh, someone unexpected, the three amigos are uh, here to, uh, to take uh, the place of uh, Mr Shorten with some questions. Uh, Senator uh, Stephen Conroy, um, no longer Senator, uh, the Honourable uh, David Feeney and uh, Ms Gay Brockman. Um, I think we should probably have about time for uh, 10 minutes, perhaps a little bit more on questions, depending on um, how eager you are to ask them. So let me uh, open the floor to you. Uh, uh, hello, David Fricker, Director General of the National Archives. And of course, we have a responsibility for the integrity of Commonwealth uh, information. Uh, perhaps Senator Conroy, um, uh, the Leader of Opposition mentioned in terms of the national security landscape um, the cyber security and I'd be very interested to hear what the the current thinking is around the policy responses to the threat of cyber security and I have a particular interest in the threat to the integrity of the Commonwealth Government. Yeah look thanks. Uh, in government we introduced a data storage uh, protection regime that was fairly robust. Uh, it required the sign off of to uh, secretaries of departments before you could store data overseas uh, of particular, and there were great gradations of types of data. So we're very uh, keen to ensure that Australian data is protected. Uh, this government have changed that and reduced the uh, bars to jump over uh, that you need to do to be able to store data overseas. So. I think there's an area there where we're probably still going to have a bit of a disagreement uh, with the government on you know, actual data storage. I was lucky enough to be sitting at the dialogue dinner on Saturday night next to the Deputy Director of the CIA, Cyber. So I actually had quite a lengthy conversation with him about some of these issues. Uh, and I asked what uh, he felt was the White House thinking when they announced recently that they wanted to do a cyber response given the, uh, the penetration of uh, their American uh, personnel records recently, which is quite disastrous for them. Uh, and he said that that's a very live discussion that's taking place right now. How far do you go? Do you reveal how potent your uh, capability is as a punishment? He also made the interesting point that very strongly sent the message, particularly to the Chinese and the Russians, to stop hacking commercially. Uh, and so when they were sending this message about their strength of response, uh, the sort of message coming back was, but you said it was okay to have a go at the government. Uh, so there is a live debate within uh, the Alliance community, the Five Eyes, about what should be the level of response. I don't think that's been settled yet but there is just increasing concern at the severity of the attacks. Uh, and the, 
I think uh, Ambassador Berry uh, was previously the head of the organisation that got hacked. He, you know, he says, oh, geez, Mr. Bullet there got out early. Uh, but uh, but he, he gave a very telling conversation uh, when I was chatting with him uh, about the level of security that the, each individual agency has. It's like the top agencies would have what you expect, unless, of course, you've got a Snowden who just has the key to the door and, and, and opens it and takes everything out. But in terms of the securities within each of the different agencies, uh, it's just not up to the level it needs to be. Uh, and so I think there's uh, the security issues that need to be addressed both in a defensive sense, and we have to be part of that discussion as the five eyes, uh, but also there is well, what is that response. But uh, I couldn't preempt what the, the discussions are at the moment, but it, it's been taken seriously enough to contemplate uh, a cyber offensive move. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, Toby, I think you had your hand up. Here's the mic. Thank you. Toby Feakin from the Institute. Um, the cyber question's been asked, so I'll move on to counterterrorism. Um, a, a few words spoken about uh, Labour's approach on that front. And I was interested, you said that, that there was mention of the approach to Muslim communities and, and the need to um, not isolate them. And I was, I was wondering if you could say a few words about how your approach would perhaps be different from currently uh, what the government is uh, putting out there. Yeah, look, uh, there's, there's a couple of different aspects to that. I mean, we're very much guided by what I think Bill quoted him, David Irving. Uh, we receive more tips from the Muslim community uh, from parents of kids that are contemplating leaving the country or doing something unbelievably horrific. Uh, and money's been set aside and there's been criticism that it hasn't been spent fast enough to try and bring people together to try and mount that. So I think there's, there's an area where we've talked a big fight, but we haven't actually got down to the organisation on the ground to try and manage it. So I, I'd want to see a focus on reaching out faster and further than we've currently been doing. I think good intentions haven't quite got uh, to a delivery. Uh, I think some of the language is unhelpful. And I know of stories of uh, our agencies saying upwards, please stop uh, making some of the more colourful statements because it is actually causing that alienation and we need to work with these communities. And if they're feeling alienated, they will not reach out to us in the way that they have been doing. So I think some of the language that's been around has been unhelpful uh, in trying to maximise our interaction and, and support from those Muslim communities. Let's have a few more questions. One over here, Dr Doug. Uh, Doug Keane from the Office of National Assessments. Uh, you've made it very clear that you want submarines built in Australia. But there's a wider question. Uh, what is your view of the future of the strategic relationship between Australia and Japan, which, of course, has been growing considerably over recent years? Thank you. Look, in case, uh, I think David wants to jump in here as well, but just in case there's any confusion, we've made it very clear that we welcome Japan being part of a process and we welcome, if an outcome is that Japan build the subs, we welcome that. We want them obviously built here. So we, we have no issue at all with the quality capability of Japanese submarines, but we do feel that there's a need for them to be uh, built in Australia for all the reasons Bill's articulated. You've probably heard me say ten times. But I think David might want to talk about the broader strategic. Yeah, well, I think you nailed it, Stephen. I, I'm, we were the in government. We of course uh, assigned a, a DSTO officer into Japan to talk to Japan about how we might meaningfully collaborate with them on submarine technology. So, uh, from a very early juncture, we took a very positive view about um, how that interaction could work. But we never imagined, nor do we imagine now, that those submarines should be built anywhere other than in Australia. And that's for our own very uh, clear strategic requirements. That's not uh, disparaging any potential um, partner. That's simply about our own view about what Australia requires. As to your question about um, what does it mean for the broader strategic um, envagelment of Australia in North Asia, 
Uh, well, I guess my first point would be let's have that conversation because there hasn't been one. Uh, and if uh, Prime Minister Abbott uh, and Prime Minister Abe have a view about that, they should perhaps share it with Australia and our strategic and defence community so we can have a conversation about it and its implications. Um, because obviously moments like the Sakakus um, could be of enormous import to Australia and, and, and our posture. Um, but in the absence of a reasonable conversation and a rational conversation, um, we, we're not in a position to say what the implications of that are. And we've got a question over here from uh, Richard Brabham Smith. Richard Brabham Smith, Australian National University. These days, whenever I hear the phrase shipbuilding in Australia, I release the safety catch on my revolver. And the reason I do this is because there's a sense of um, missed opportunity. From a geostrategic point of view, the things that matter to Australia in, in defence are things that fly and electronics, including, I mean, obviously, modern uh, software-driven electronics, they are much more important, especially than what used to be called, if I can still use the phrase, the black trades involved in shipbuilding. Why is it, do you think, that there is so little public discussion of the need for our industry base to support aircraft and electronics in defence? Um, well, thank you for the question. I think with respect to aerospace, there has been uh, a uh, now long-running and well-established notion that um, there, there is no uh, prospect of an Australian aerospace industry moving beyond uh, the sustainment uh, and maintenance of capabilities, whereas Australians have always, I think, had a deeper sense, a deeper rooted sense about uh, what the potential and importance is of our maritime industries. In terms of um, electronics, I, I, I would point to uh, the success of the anti-ship missile defence system um, recently um, in our upgraded ANZACs as a demonstration of the fact that uh, not only are there still great innovations happening in the Australian defence industries, but those in innovations have been picked up and successfully used um, to remarkable success by the Royal Australian Navy and, and Defence. So, um, we are not out of that game, and in our recent successes as a nation in that space is something we should all draw great pride and inspiration from. Uh, and I think that speaks to the fact that a uh, Australian uh, defence industry um, is able to develop innovations, uh, and Bill spoke tonight about imagination. We are able to imagine uh, creativity and productivity in this country that can do things that make a mark on the world stage. Uh, and that anti-ship missile defence system is an outstanding example of that. So I think I'd like to uh, uh, ask... If, oh, sorry, Gaga, please. Yeah, and I think your question gets uh, to the broader issue of <coughs> communication about defence. And this was a very strong message. Peter and I were discussing it just over dinner. <coughs> a very strong message that came out of the public consultation component of the white paper. And I, I really believe that, uh, that there is not a, enough discussion about defence uh, not just capability, not just ADF, but what about the defence contribution to the Australian community? There's not enough discussion about that, enough, not enough communication about that with the broader community and more generally. It was a very strong message that came out of that white paper consultation. I understand that the Minister was taking it on board, but I do think that uh, it is an issue that we as, as policy makers ASPE as, as, uh, as think tankers on this issue, you as people involved in this strategic space, need, we all need to take a look at this and look at what we're doing in terms of communicating what's happening in the defence space, in the strategic space, with the broader Australian community. Uh, and it's not just on shipbuilding, it's on, it's on strategic issues, it's on defence capability, it's on, it's on um, the ADF, it's on a broad range of issues. There's, there's a people dimension to that as well, uh, uh, Gay. Uh, one thing that uh, Mr Shorten's speech didn't dwell on, except as it related to the troops in, in Iraq, was about the, the people aspects of, um, of your policy thinking. 
uh, I'd just be interested in any comments you might want to make about that, not, not only as it relates to the ADF, but as it, as it also relates to uh, defence civilians. Well, I also had a chip at, uh, well, no, it was a bit misdirected at, uh, at Peter about uh, the lack of women again involved in this uh, defence space. I mean, I just look around this room and, uh, and there's, it's nice to see a few sisters out there, but uh, there's not many of us. So I do think that uh, we need more women in, engaged in this space. There's women out there. There's women doing fantastic work uh, and there's women coming through the ranks uh, just in terms of the, uh, through the universities and uh, through the ADF as well as the civilian hierarchy. So we need more women engaged in the discussion. Uh, we need more women engaged in the public, uh, the policy formulation. No women on the white paper. No women on the first principles review. No women involved in the uh, in the consultation, uh, the white paper consultation paper. You cannot tell me that there's no women in this uh, in this area that can contribute in a significant and meaningful way. So, uh, on women, we definitely need more women in, in women in the space, but we also need diversity across the board. I mean, the very strong message that came through from the chiefs uh, when, they, uh, when they were inducted last year was the fact that uh, they want to be inclusive, they want to develop an inclusive culture. So we need a diversity of cultures right across the ADF and in the civilian space. Defence, the civilian space does pretty well, but uh, the ADF uh, compared to the rest of the nation doesn't. And so I think greater diversity across every level will greatly enhance our capability in the ADF and also in the civilian space. Thanks, Guy. Well, maybe a question from the sisters? No, yeah. in that case, we'll take a question from uh, Vern <laughs> instead. Your, and then I think there was one last question from at the very back table. We'll go to you last, but uh, Vern, please. Thank you very much. I'm a visiting fellow with the Institute uh, from Canada. I came in a couple of days ago, actually. Um, a lot of discussion taking place in Canada, I know here in Australia, surrounds de-radicalization, in particular in our high-risk communities. Um, there's been a shifting focus, certainly in Canada, on pre-radicalization. What would you say or what would you see as the future of keeping it from occurring rather than dealing with it after it does? Uh, well, thank you for the question. It's a very fraught and complex space and uh, it's a challenge, I think, when looking uh, globally to find outstanding examples of programs that have succeeded. I've seen some in Singapore that claim uh, de-radicalisation programs in Singapore that claim very great success and I've read about some in Germany um, that also uh, suggest great success. I think uh, the message for Australian policymakers is uh, that there needs to be a strong effort in terms of case management and peer management um, and we don't want to confuse de-radicalisation de programs with what is otherwise broader community outreach. And I think that line has blurred in more recent times and that's been unhelpful uh, in this public policy space. So uh, I think, uh, like all policymakers, we're in the market for what works. Uh, we've certainly seen, for instance, de-radicalisation efforts by nations like Saudi Arabia not work. Um, so there is no very clear template for what is successful. Um, as I say, more recently, we have looked to Germany for inspiration. Um, but I think wherever there is success, we have to look at what makes it work and, and, and embrace it. And we need to be perhaps, uh, perhaps suspicious is too strong a term, but uh, I think there needs to be a strong emphasis on individuals and families. Um, and we, don't, we should not imagine that broader community outreach programs are also de-radicalisation efforts. We'll go to the very back table for our last question. Uh, g'day, Doug <coughs> sorry, Douglas Fry, uh, interning uh, at ASPE uh, by Macquarie University. Uh, yeah, again, uh, looking at um, radicalisation in Australia um, and, and working with Muslim communities, uh, we've seen a very forceful emergence of uh, the right wing uh, in Australia over the last six months or so. I'm talking Reclaim Australia and offshoot groups like the United Patriots Front, uh, Australians against Islam, that sort of thing. Uh, my, my question is, how, how do we balance the right to uh, political expression uh, in this country with, with you know, inclusiveness, I suppose? Well, firstly, I think Stephen Conroy earlier made a very fine point, and that is that uh, we need our national political leaders to strike the right tenor and to shape the debate in a way that uh, gives justice to our 
uh, claim to be states people rather than rampant populists. So I think the first point is that the national conversation um, should be shaped insofar as it's possible by uh, politicians in a way that is uh, conducive uh, to there being social cohesion rather than uh, division. I also would be uh, hesitant to exaggerate um, the role that Reclaim Australia and other groups um, have played or will play um, in our national debate. We have these outbreaks from time to time. Um, uh, episodes of violence and lunacy do attract the fascination of uh, our tabloid press, but we should not imagine that for being anything other than um, the fringe dwellers that they are. Um, and the obligation on all of us continues to be to make sure that we have a conversation in this country about our freedoms, what it is for us to be Australian and how it is um, that those freedoms should be protected in a way that uh, means we continue to enjoy um, the lifestyle and the prosperity that we have. And that's why in more recent times we saw very interestingly um, the government cabinet split um, around propositions um, that uh, they thought were going too far. I did remark humorously to my colleagues that when Senator Cory Bernardi suggests that government proposals are going too far, you really know you have a problem. So uh, I think we've seen the government itself stumble um, over its efforts to lurch to the right here. And as always, um, truth is found in the sensible centre. Um, and having a sensible conversation and reminding ourselves about how we can enlist every Australian in the task of protecting our way of life. Well, Stephen Conroy, David Feeney, Gabe Brockman, thank you very much. I really appreciate the, your uh, gamesmanship to uh, volunteer to uh, come up. <laughs> it's one thing to deliver a set-piece speech. It's quite another thing to Stephen stand in front of an audience like this and, uh, and answer a series of questions across a very wide range. So thank you very much. And colleagues, can you please thank our team? <laughs>